If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Believe it or not, we are almost done. This morning, the title of the sermon is Anointed. Mark chapter 14, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And this is a pretty familiar story if you look at it. There's a couple of different components of this story. We'll see here the chief priests and the scribes. They're looking for a way now, approaching Passover. They're looking for a way now to arrest Jesus and to put him to death. So a part of that component this morning, a part of that piece of this story is they are looking for a way to arrest Jesus and put him to death. And Judas here in our story this morning, the betrayer of Jesus, is going to help them out. And we'll get to that part of the story here in a moment. But look at this woman, too. She is anointing the head of Jesus with oil. It's an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume of pure nard that is a a fragrance from the spikenard uh, root, and it's mixed with oil. She is anointing the head of Jesus there with oil. And this anointing done by this woman and other women in the Bible was not physically to prepare the body of Jesus for burial prior to his death on the cross. That would be done after. And we're going to look at that this morning uh, when we get there, but... The fact is, this act, this woman breaking this alabaster jar of perfume open and pouring it on the head of Jesus, Jesus calls this act a noble act. And he recognized this as this woman doing what she could do to show her love and devotion for Jesus. And this act was really an acceptance of Jesus as Messiah. What she's doing in pouring oil on his head this morning is an acceptance that Jesus would die. And she's also showing an acceptance that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the holder, really, of eternal life. And she's acknowledging all of those things as she is pouring oil, pouring perfume on the head of Jesus here in the story this morning. But if we notice in the story, if you remember this, and we're going to read through this in a minute, the disciples become very indignant about this, right? This is such a waste of money. Indignant there means that they believe that that this was being done unfairly, as in this perfume, this oil mix, this fragrant mix of oil and perfume is being wasted by being poured on the head of Jesus. They, loving Jesus, wanted to actually take the money from this and bless the poor. And Jesus says in our story here this morning, this is, this is a good thing, but what she is doing is focusing in on Jesus in this moment, in his presence. And again, what he says about this, this is a noble thing that she is doing. And then he's saying about her, she is doing in this moment what she can do for Jesus. She's not worried about who is around her. She's not worried about taking this and loving Jesus so much that she's going to go out and do something for the poor community. She's actually in the presence of Jesus in this moment saying, no, I want to show my love and devotion for him, so I'm going to break this jar open and I'm going to pour it on his head. And Jesus says, she is doing what she can do in this moment for me. And that's our challenge this morning. When we begin to evaluate ourselves individually, when we begin to look at our own lives, The question is, just like this woman, when Jesus says what she does here is noble, she's doing what she can do. Have you done what you can do for Jesus, or are you holding back? Have you you done what you can do for Jesus, or are you holding back? And when we think about this story, we would say, well, I'm not in the presence of Jesus. Jesus has ascended, and he is seated right now at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Amen. He's not in this room. Uh, Physically, personally, I'm not in his presence. I can't pour oil on his head. 
I can't pour oil on his feet. I can't do these things because I'm not physically in his presence. But what I can do for Jesus is what he has given me to do for him. I can be obedient in those things right here, right now. If I think about this in in this way, think about Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, think about that. We start viewing the mercies of God. Paul says, I urge you from that viewpoint to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is, he says, your true worship. We want to truly worship God. We want to truly worship him. Then we give him our lives. We lay our lives down for him and say, you work in us and through us. And Paul continues there. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, the pleasing, the perfect will of God. In response to the mercy of God, which is Christ crucified for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world, we should really present our lives to him to be used by him. Amen? This is how I truly worship God. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to know what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of our God so that I can live my life for him. And again, I ask, have you done what you can do for Jesus or are you holding back? And if we think about that this morning, are we holding a piece of ourselves back? Are we truly presenting ourselves, our lives, as a living sacrifice for him in view of the mercies of our God? Are we holding something back? Are we keeping back from him? I want to give you at the end of this message this morning, I want to give you one way, one way that I want to encourage you and challenge you To get involved, one way that you can actually answer this question in your own life so that it will help progress or or at least project you on this path. Have you done what you can do for Jesus or are you holding back? So think about that this morning. We're going to look at three different stories this morning about the anointing of Jesus. We're going to look at the chief priest here. The scribes who are looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus, to kill him. And we're going to look at how Judas got involved in that plan. Some details about that plan. I love the details in there because as a police officer, I like to put all the evidence together in this case. It's pretty neat. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we, we can read this story this morning. Give us eyes to see this, ears to hear. God, give us hearts that are open God, hearts that are soft right now. The example, Jesus, of this woman pouring this perfume mix on your head, you said would be spoken wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world. So Jesus, help us to see the importance of this this morning. And we know that you are there seated at the right hand of our Father in heaven. We can't physically repeat this this morning, but what we can do is present our lives to you. We can allow you to work in us and through us. So God, just help us as we challenge ourselves, as we really evaluate our own lives and our usefulness for you this morning. Help us to uh, really just to be honest before you this morning. We love you so much, and we thank you for this. We thank you for your grace And we thank you for your mercy. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark 14, look at verse number one. It says here, It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and to kill him. And here's what they said, verse two, Not during the festival, so that there won't be a riot among the people. So... If we think back over the last couple of weeks, we've been three days before the Passover. Jesus has been preaching and teaching in the temple and around the temple. 
And last week, he's leaving the temple there, observing the impressive buildings, the impressive design work, the architectural design work around the temple and the temple mount there. And then Jesus goes up on the Mount of Olives. He sits down with four of his guys, and he gives them the Olivet Discourse. We studied that last week. It's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, study into Bible prophecy. Uh, they, they go to bed that night, they get up, it's now two days before the Passover, Mark says, and the Festival of Unleavened Bread. I wanted to stop here and just explain this to you. Luke 22, verse number 1 says, The Festival of Unleavened Bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. We need to understand that when we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we talk about Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, those terms can be interchangeable. They can be used for one another. What this is, is it, it's an eight-day festival. This is one of the pilgrimage feasts that all of the male Israelites would have to uh, go to or travel to, journey to Jerusalem and be there for those festivities. The first month of the Hebrew calendar is Nisan. On the 14th day of that month, they would sacrifice the Passover, one year old male, unblemished sheep or goat. They would sacrifice that Passover animal on the 14th day at twilight. And then they would eat the Pesach, that Passover meal, on the 14th going into the 15th day. The 15th day of Nisan is the festival of unleavened bread. And then from the 15th through the 21st, they would have all kinds of festivities and activities there in Jerusalem. Sacrifices were being made. There were Sabbath days that were to be observed on the 15th day and the 21st day. But all eight days, the 14th, Passover, the 15th is the festival of unleavened bread all the way through the 21st. So all eight days could be referred to as the Passover or the festival of unleavened bread. And I wanted you to know that because on the Hebrew calendar, actually, tomorrow morning at about 8 a.m. in Israel, 8 a.m. our time, tomorrow morning, Many Israelite family members there in Israel will sit down and celebrate Passover. They will celebrate and they will have these Passover meals. They will eat the Passover meal together. So that's actually uh, uh, consistent with the Hebrew calendar. And that's what we're approaching here in our text. It says it's two days before that week, that, that eight-day festival. There in verse number one, it says it was two days before the Passover festival and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes, they were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and to kill him. And they said not during this festival, not during that entire festival. So they wanted to wait until after the festival or at least do anything that they were looking to do to Jesus out of the view of all of the people that were congregating there in Jerusalem. And that's where later we'll talk about this. This is how Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, fits into this story. It's very interesting. Look at verse number three. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the jar and she poured it on his head. Again, this is a very expensive perfume. Tells us here and just uh, in verse number five that the disciples who were indignant over this act they're beginning to point out for us that this was worth about 300 denarii. That's 300 uh, days worth of work. That's about a year's worth of labor. So they're saying this is about a year's worth of a salary that is just being poured out now on the head of Jesus. This is from the uh, spikenard plant, and this is different from the anointing oil that we find in Exodus 30 for the ordination of Aaron and his sons. 
This is probably different than the oil used by Samuel to anoint King Saul or King David. This is specific. This is something that would have been popularly used here because we see it in different times. But after the death of Jesus, after he was crucified on the cross and they bring him down, there's a different mixture of oil and spices that they anoint his body with. John 19 verses 39 through 40 says this, Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. They took Jesus' body, they wrapped it in in linen cloths with the fragrant spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. So here, we see that there's a mixture of 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. So different, these fragrant spices, different than the anointing oil here that this woman is using. We see this, though, in a couple of different stories. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. I wanted you to see this one as well. These are comparable and comparable here to this story this morning. But different times, and I believe there are three different times that Jesus is anointed with oil in this way. And I'll show you these three different times to include Mark chapter 14 here that we're studying this morning. But Luke chapter 7, verses 36. I'm sorry, I said Matthew 7. Luke 7. Let's do that. Luke 7. I was looking at Matthew 7 saying, that's not in there. Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. And it says this, Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town, who was a sinner, found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him. Look at his name, verse 40. He says, Simon. So this Simon is a Pharisee. The Simon in Mark 14 is a leper. Two different Simons, common name here. So two different stories, but verse 40, Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you, he said. And he replies to Jesus, say it, teacher. Verse 41, a creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet. But she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Look at this. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who are at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If you look at verse 47 again, it says, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. And look at this. That's why she loved much. From this place of being forgiven by Jesus, she presents herself before Jesus, weeping and crying. She washes his feet with the tears that are streaming from her face. She's wiping his feet with her hair. And then she is preparing his feet for the anointing that she is going to do. And then she begins to anoint his feet with that oil-perfume mixture. 
And she's doing this from a place of being forgiven. She's doing this again, like Romans 12, in view of the mercies of God. She is responding to this love and forgiveness by Jesus and saying, I want nothing more than to wash his feet and to wipe his feet and to anoint his feet. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, here's another story, and many people take John chapter 12 and Mark 14 and they make them the same story. I think there's a couple of subtle differences here that I believe keep them separate. But if you want to say that John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14 are the same story, you can go ahead. You can, you can argue that. Uh, you can defend that. I'll say you're wrong, but you, you don't have to agree with me. The reason that I love that it's, that it's a couple of different stories, this would be the third, the third story in the Gospels of Jesus being anointed by oil prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. And I think that's significant. I'll tell you why here in a second. John chapter 12, it says this, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had risen from the, de the dead. So they gave him a dinner for him there. Martha was serving him, or them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointing Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? John tells us the motives of Judas here. Verse 6, he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of it or part of what was put in it. And Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. And if we see here, the woman in Mark chapter 14 is anointing the head of Jesus with this expensive perfume. Here, Martha is serving them. Lazarus is reclining at the table. And then Mary takes the same perfume mixture, but she pours it on his feet and wipes his feet with her hair. But Judas here, he begins to be a bit indignant. His motives are pointed out by the gospel writer here, John, which we'll get to in a second. But what I find interesting now is in Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 7 and John chapter 12, we have three incidents that are mentioned where women in the Bible are coming to Jesus, accepting who he is as Messiah. In view of the mercies of God, they are responding to who he is, and they are loving him, showing their devotion for him, and they are pouring uh, anointing oil on his head or on his feet. They are wiping his feet with their hair. One of them, this sinful woman in Luke chapter 7, is kissing his feet. What's amazing about this is if you think back to the Mosaic law, it says this in Deuteronomy 17.6, the one condemned to die is to be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. No one is to be executed on the testimony of a single witness. And then in Matthew 18, 16, it says, But if he won't listen, talking about a brother who offends you, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. The reason that I love these three different stories about women in the Bible coming and anointing Jesus' feet and his head, they are accepting him as Messiah. They are saying Jesus, the Messiah, is going to die for the sins of the world. He is going to go to a cross and lay his life down for all of us. And they are witnessing, they are bearing witness to the fact that Jesus is Messiah and he is going to die for the sins of the world. And that's why I love 
to think about Mark 14, Luke 7, John 12 as three distinct stories about women. Ladies, do you hear this? Women in the Bible being used by God to testify and and give witness, to bear witness to the fact that Jesus is Messiah and he's going to the cross. I think this is such an amazing part of this. Go back to Mark 14. Verse number four, it says, but some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? Matthew 26, 8 says, when the disciples saw it, they were indignant. So here in Mark, he says, some were expressing indignation. Maybe he's trying to save face a little bit, but Matthew gives us the full fact here. It was the disciples together in this group who were becoming indignant about this. They were becoming angry that this was unfairly. Think about it in our day and age. Unequitably being used on the head of Jesus and not being sold so that we can go and do ministry to the poor. Verse number 5 tells us, For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her again. 300 denarii. Denarii is a day's wage. So when we think about 300 days worth of wages, that would be a year's worth of pay. Can you imagine taking a year's worth of pay, a year's worth, 12 months of your salary, and pouring it on the head of Jesus? Can you imagine taking that and pouring it on the feet of Jesus? No, yeah, I can't either. I can't even imagine that. Which is why the disciples here are becoming so indignant about this. And it says there, they began to scold her. Remember back to John 12. John 12, 6 says, He, Judas, didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. So the gospel writer there, John, tells us the motive of of Judas. He wanted to steal this money. That's why he pointed it out there in John chapter 12. But here, the disciples here are indignant over this. They wanted to show their love and devotion for Jesus by selling this perfume and using that money to bless the poor. Jesus is going to point out for us here in a second that that is a good motive. There's nothing wrong with wanting to bless the poor. There's nothing wrong with reaching out to that community to do community outreach in this way. And we understand the gospel writer here, Mark, is telling us that the the disciples here are becoming indignant over this because they're seeing this, that they could show their love They could show their devotion for Jesus by selling this and using this to go bless somebody else. But this woman here, she has done this in the presence of Jesus. She has done this for Jesus. She has done this to Jesus because of who he is, who she recognizes him as, and what she knows that he is going to do for her and for this whole world. Verse 6, Jesus replied, he jumps in and defends her, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me, Jesus says. Verse 7, you always have the poor with you. And you can do what is good for them whenever you want. Did you catch that? Jesus is not saying that their desire to sell this, use that money to bless the poor is a bad thing. He's saying you can do good for them whenever you want because they are always going to be with you. But he says, verse 7, you do not always have me. Verse 8, she has done what she could. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. She did what she could do in the moment. This is what she had. This is what she could present to Jesus. This is the act of love and devotion that she could do for him in that moment. Yes, she she could have shown her love to Jesus by doing something for others, but here in the presence of Jesus, 
recognizing him as Messiah, she says, no, I want to take this very expensive jar of perfume and I want to pour it on the head of my Savior. And she chose to do what she could do, what God had blessed her with. She turned around and said, no, I want to just pour this on the head of of Jesus. Again, we are not in the presence face to face right now with Jesus. We cannot mimic this. We cannot do this. But again, in view of the mercies of God, what can we do? Present ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what we can do in this moment. Verse number eight again, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. Verse 9, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Because of her act of love and devotion, her legend lives on as a declaration of the gospel. She gave what she could to Jesus in that moment of being in his presence. She didn't put a personal loving relationship with Jesus that showed her acceptance of who he is as Messiah. She didn't put that after a righteous and a good act, right? We get that backwards today. We do. If we're honest with this, folks, if we look around, especially at the social gospel community, we want to show our love and devotion by just going out and and rescuing, helping feeding, providing for the community that we have surrounding us that is less fortunate than us. We want to look at the homeless community. We want to look at the community surrounding us that is, that is suffering, that is poor. And we want to love them and we want to encourage them and we want to give to them and provide for them. But then we check the box and say, that's it, that's the gospel. Don't miss this. Jesus says what she has done will be told Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, her loving, wonderful, devoted act, her noble act will be told alongside of the gospel. Why? Because she recognizes who Jesus is. I can go do all of these things for the homeless community. I can go do all of these things for the poor community. I can go all, do all of these things for those less fortunate than me. But unless I take them and point them to Jesus as Messiah, I'm not doing them any good. And I have to know that. And I have to encourage all of us in that. Because we can oftentimes feel like we're not doing enough. We can look at other faith-based organizations and say, man, they are out there doing it. They're doing food drives and all these things, and we're not partaking in that. Those things are good. Jesus says that here. Those things are good. But we must point all of them, we must point them to a relationship with Jesus. We must tell them Jesus is the Messiah. We must tell them Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the Savior of the world because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He's the holder of eternal life, and that's what they need. That's what we need. Jesus says, truly I tell you, verse 9, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What a legend that lives on to this day. Verse 10, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Quickly, go to Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at some inside details that the gospel writer here, Luke, gives us. Remember this, the chief priest here, the scribes, they're looking for a way to arrest Jesus. They want to put Jesus to death, but all of the festivities are beginning. It's two days before the Passover. 
the festival of unleavened bread, large crowds are beginning to gather in Jerusalem, and they don't want to, out of fear for the, the crowds, out of, out of fear for this large gathering of people, they don't want to arrest Jesus and put him to death in front of them because they know the crowds are going to turn on them. So here's what they do. Luke 22, verse number 3. It says, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. He went away and discussed with the chief priest and the temple police how he could hand him over to them. They were glad and agreed to give him silver. Matthew 26 tells us it was 30 pieces of silver. They were glad, Luke 22 verse 5, and agreed to give him silver. So he accepted the offer, look at this, and started looking for a good opportunity to betray him when the crowd was not present. So this is the interesting fact about Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. He's an inside man. He's, he's the, the asset that they have inside this group, inside the, the group of disciples that get to walk around and, and, and visit with and hear from and learn from and fellowship with Jesus. And what they are, they are afraid of the crowds. They don't want to arrest Jesus. They don't want to put him to death in front of the crowds. So they need, they need somewhere, sometime, private to do this away from the people so Judas their inside man says hey I know the patterns here I'll go I'll hang out with Jesus I'll find a perfect time when they're going to be alone and then I'll come and I'll turn him over to you and we will see that over the next couple of weeks as we continue to study through the gospel here of Mark but Judas is that inside man. He's going in. He's going to betray Jesus. And he's going to do it in private, away from the crowds. That's very interesting as we get to that. But I want to think about more about this, this woman pouring oil on the head of Jesus. She's doing what she can do in his presence. She's doing what she can do with what she has. Right? She's doing what she can do, accepting that Jesus is Messiah, seeing that Jesus is going to die on the cross for her sins. Now, looking back on the cross, we know that Jesus has since ascended to the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for us there. And now he has given us the great commission. We, Followers of Jesus Christ are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to obey, to observe all the things that Jesus taught. We are not in the presence of Jesus to anoint his head, to anoint his feet, to wipe his feet with our hair, with the tears that would no doubt be streaming from our faces in his presence. But we, in, the, in view of the mercies that he has for us, in view of the mercies of God, that is Jesus Christ on the cross, in the grave, and raised to life again, in view of those mercies, we can present our lives to him as living sacrifices. And again, that's my, my challenge. Have you done what you can do for Jesus? What you can do? Not everyone can do the same thing. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? God has specifically given each of us different talents, different giftings, different areas of relational influence. Think about that. And we can do what we can do for Jesus, or we can hold back. And I think about this constantly. Do we take our calendars, look at our calendars and say, okay, God, I want you to have the best of everything. I want you to have total access. I want you to work in me and through me, regardless of where I am or what I'm doing. Or do we hold some of that back and say, no, I'm going to keep this for myself. And that's typically what I see today in our day and age. We are in a fight, folks, against the clock. That's literally what we're doing day after day after day. I got four kids. I know what it's all about. We have a calendar. 
And how much time do we give to Christ? How much time does, does he have to work in us and through us? How much time are we devoting to him? And I really want you to think about this this week. I said I would give you one way, and I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you in this. On Tuesday night, we are meeting. We have four more weeks of foundations, the radical requirements of following Jesus. This is a great opportunity to get involved, to come and participate in this. This is really, it's been a great conversation. Last Tuesday was awesome. It was totally, totally, I could say this, rad. We had a great, great time learning from Scripture what it is to be justified, sanctified, and glorified. And now, this week, we're going to look at the radical requirements of following Jesus as he laid out for us. He taught us this. We're going to look at these radical requirements and say, okay, what is this all about? Because the goal of this class is to really just push us to this place of understanding what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and how to get other people to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That's really what it's all about. And I believe this is one way when we think about what have you done, what, what can you do for Jesus? You know, what has he given you to do for him? Instead of holding back, this is one way where you could say, man, I'm going to commit to this, I'm going to go to this, I'm going to be in relationship with other people, I want to learn from Jesus the radical requirements of following him, and I'm going to commit to living my life for him. And this is one way to do it, folks. This is an awesome way to participate, to jump in, to get involved. If you really think about that, it's an an amazing, an amazing thing to learn from the word of God how to follow Christ in a more intimate way, and then how to go and make disciples, introducing other people to him in this. So... That's what, what I want to encourage you with from this story this morning. Think about that. Really evaluate that. Uh, our kids go to this class on Tuesday night, so it's kid-friendly. Even if it's not kid-friendly, there's, there's food, and the kids can run around. It's, it's actually very informal. We have a great, great time. So I want to encourage you with that. Stand with me. We're going to sing a song in closing. I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for this. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this story. Thank you for this woman, Jesus, that anointed your head with oil. Thank you for these women who really just showed such faith, such love, and such devotion to you. Thank you that we have these stories, that we can think about them, that we can really just envision being in that room, just sitting there, smelling this fragrant perfume as it is being poured on your head. Understanding that they are proclaiming in that moment that you were going to die on the cross for all of us. Jesus, what an amazing story. And you've given each of us an opportunity in this life to serve you, to worship you, to live for you, to surrender all to you. We fight this cultural pressure, God, to hold back, to keep for ourselves. God, help us to really evaluate that this morning in view of your mercy. God, give us the boldness to present our lives as living sacrifices to you, to truly worship you in this way. God, we love you so much and we thank you for this. Accept this song now. In Jesus' name, amen.